Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Ron Vail from Genelia Research Campus, and I'd like to welcome everybody to Life Science Across the Globe. Uh, so these are our first talks of 2021, and uh, we're very pleased uh, to welcome uh, this week uh, the Rockefeller uh, Institute in New York City and they are uh, the guests of our sister institute, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, so today's speakers will be introduced by uh, Dr. Rick Lifton, who is the president of uh, Rockefeller. And uh, I've known Rick for uh, many years. In fact, uh, we overlapped for a bit in the Stanford MD PhD program. I can definitely say that uh, Rick uh, definitely made better use of the combined degree. Uh, I actually did not finish my MD, but uh, Rick's career uh, is really exemplary of uh, what can be accomplished at the interface of medicine and research. And over the years, uh, Rick has developed an amazing uh, research program to understand what are the most prevalent uh, diseases uh, in the world, which is hypertension. And he, uh, systematically over his career really I identified the genetic basis of many genes that contribute uh, to normal homeostatic uh, blood pressure. And for this research work, um, Rick was recognized uh, with the uh, very important uh, breakthrough prize in uh, 2014. And since uh, 2016, Rick has been um, the president of the Rockefeller. So uh, now I'd like to bring on uh, Rick. Thank you for joining us and he'll introduce today's speakers. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, we're delighted to be with you today and I'd like to thank uh, Bruce Stillman for extending the kind invitation for us to uh, be with you today. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rockefeller University, we're a small institute on the Upper East Side in uh, Manhattan. We have 70 faculty who are all dedicated to uh, biomedical science. And although we're small, it's a remarkable group of scientists cutting across uh, much of the scientific landscape. Uh, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, uh, six members of our faculty have been awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine or chemistry, uh, including three in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, scientific institution. And I think the clarity of our mission, science for the benefit of humanity, uh, exemplifies uh, what many of the uh, groups that uh, are involved in this program uh, uh, pursue, uh, recognizing that uh, when you've got a single mission, uh, that uh, provides tremendous concentration of effort. Uh, I'm very pleased today to uh, introduce our two speakers, uh, one a scientific talk and one a talk that reflects uh, much of the culture of the university. Uh, the, the first speaker will be Michelle Nussenzweig. Uh, Michelle uh, obtained his undergraduate degree uh, at uh, NYU, obtained his MD and PhD degrees from NYU for the MD and from Rockefeller University for his uh, PhD. He went off to uh, pursue uh, training in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, did postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard and was recruited back to Rockefeller in uh, 1990. Uh, and he now is a, a professor, head of the Laboratory of Molecular Immunology uh, and has done uh, quite extraordinary work, some of which he'll tell you about uh, today. Uh, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, has won the uh, Koch Prize and the uh, Pasteur Prize and many other prestigious uh, awards uh, and is very well known for uh, his work in a wide range of areas in immunology. Uh, but uh, we're very excited and proud about the work that he'll, he'll tell you about today that relates directly to the COVID pandemic. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Rick. Um, just going to put up my slides so we can get started. All right, so um, what I want to do today is um, have a brief introduction um, for immunology. And I'm going to apologize for those of you that are very sophisticated. This is really going to be uh, bare bones and, and, and really um, quite simple, but it, it encapsulates um, the way that I think about uh, problems in immunology. And then I'm gonna use that as background to talk about our work on, on the coronavirus. 
So uh, first thing um, is um, what's the immune system and, and why is it different uh, from other uh, systems in our body? Um, the, the immune system has three uh, critical properties um, and they are specificity, diversity, and memory. Memory, of course, is what's important in, in making vaccines work. So um, some many years ago, actually, uh, a, a theoretical construct was put forward to try to understand those three properties of the immune system. And I'm just going to go over that because it's, it's really very simple. Um, this thing was put forward by um, Burnett uh, and Talmadge and Letterberg, uh, who was a microbiologist uh, and uh, was doing a sabbatical actually in Australia with Burnett. That's how this came about. Um, what uh, they uh, proposed was that the immune system is composed of cells um, and that the diversity uh, in, in the immune system, uh, that is the ability to recognize many, many different uh, pathogens or invaders or uh, what have you, uh, comes from the fact that the cells in the immune system each have independent receptors that recognize uh, those, um, those pathogen features. Um, the specificity comes from the fact that each receptor on these different cells is in fact specific for one or another uh, molecule. And memory, they said, would happen when the immune system sees a pathogen, an incoming uh, virus, for example, the cells of the immune system would expand specifically. The cells that recognize that pathogen would expand specifically. So for the second time, coming around the second time, instead of trying to fish out the one cell or a few cells that are specific, you'd have a whole collection of cells uh, so that the response would be more robust and faster. Okay. Now, the way that we've learned about how this um, diversity and specificity comes about uh, is that um, you can't imagine that the genome would have enough genes to account for all of that specificity. And so what happens in the immune system is something really quite amazing, is that the uh, genome uh, contains in it uh, different pieces of the receptor genes, the antibodies, um, and puts those things together in a random fashion to create receptors, each of which in a particular cell will have a different specificity. And moreover, uh, the junctions uh, are uh, not um, specific junctions. They, they are diverse junctions. That is, they're non-exact non, um, uh, so that there's further diversity, not just combinatorial, but also junctional diversity. So you can create, here it says, 10 to the 14th different kinds of receptors. But of course, this is limited by the number of cells in our body. So in fact, um, it's many times fewer than the 10 to the 14th number. But suffice it to say that this mechanism creates a great deal of diversity, many, many different receptors, despite the fact that our genomes are limited. Now, one of the things that this construct, this theoretical construct and the uh, VDJ recombination uh, has trouble accounting for is this phenomenon that many of us are familiar with, which is that when an animal or a person uh, is given a vaccine or uh, sees an antigen, uh, the affinity of antibodies in serum increases logarithmically within a short period of time. Um, it's very hard to account for that with the clonal selection theory. And what we've learned um, over the last 20 years or so uh, is that uh, the immune system has a second diversification reaction, uh, which helps to account for that increase in affinity over time. And that is that when a cell is selected to undergo clonal expansion, it does not undergo a monomorphic expansion, but instead 
um, turns on an enzyme called AID, discovered by uh, Hanjo and Durandi, which makes small mutations uh, in the antibody genes, creating not a monomorphic collection of cells with a single receptor, but a collection of very closely related cells that differ from each other by single mutations. Uh, and then during the immune response, there is selection and selection for the antibodies that have the highest affinity. So two different diversification reactions, one as a starter and a second one to refine the affinity of the antibodies. Now, uh, this mu mutation reaction is rather simple. It's uh, a cytosine to uracil change. And what that does is to create a mismatch in the genome that can be processed by housekeeping enzymes that are present in all cells and results in somatic mutations, which I've just mentioned, gene conversion reactions, class switch recombination, which we're not going to talk about, and has also the byproduct of creating chromosome translocations, which are responsible for most human B cell cancers. Now, all of this happens in these beautiful structures called germinal centers, uh, which are present in our uh, lymphoid organs. These are highly dynamic structures where the mutation and selection occur. And there are two products of this reaction. There are the plasma cells. And these are the cells that put antibodies out. They're like little antibody factories uh, producing large quantities of antibodies that we have in our plasmas. The second product of this reaction is the memory B cell compartment. That's what's going to respond on rechallenge. Uh, and that's a far more diverse group of cells. It reflects what happens in the germinal center. Um, and has a whole collection of different receptors, some of which will be very good for the particular pathogen that started the whole thing, but others may also see the next pathogen, the one that's mutated. So it's a way of creating not just the memory for the pathogen that was starting pathogen, but for other things as well, a second group of diverse cells um, in our bodies. All right, so my lab has been trying to understand this whole process um, in mice and in humans. And in humans, um, it's particularly been difficult uh, to, to study all of this. Uh, and so um, we wanted to understand what's in that memory compartment. And to do so, um, we, we developed a method, a method of fishing out the cells that would have the specificities that we're interested in. So the B lymphocytes have on their surface, their receptors. Those are the same as the antibodies that they are producing. And um, well, if we have a, an antigen, for example, a protein uh, that we're interested in, and we want to probe this compartment, we can use that labeled protein to identify these cells because they'll stick to this because of their receptors on their surface. Once we identify them, we can use uh, cell sorting to grab onto individual cells and then use molecular biology to clone out their antibodies. So that's the method that we developed in order to study all of this in humans. So we were prepared um, and had been studying other viral um, illnesses like uh, HIV, uh, antibodies to HIV, to hepatitis, to the Zika virus, uh, and, and, a, and a number of other uh, viruses. So we were very much prepared to do this and try to understand the human immune response uh, to the coronavirus. And so when we had the first wave of the pandemic in New York City uh, at Rockefeller, um, we uh, started a program to recruit people to Rockefeller uh, that had been infected uh, so that we could obtain samples um, in order to study their immunity. Now, uh, we were not alone in doing this. In fact, this was uh, the work of an army of scientists, really. Um, 
both at Rockefeller and at other places uh, around the country. Um, and uh, this is just a list of, of some of the labs that have been involved uh, in this uh, really uh, quite uh, diverse group of people uh, working on this. Um, all right, so what did we know when we started? We knew, for example, that the virus, the coronavirus, uh, had on its surface uh, a spike protein, which it uses in order to get into cells. And in particular, we knew that there was a domain of the uh, coronavirus spike protein, the RBD, uh, which binds to a receptor on cells, the ACE2 uh, receptor, and that is how um, this virus gets into cells. And so we could focus on this part of the molecule um, because interfering with this reaction with an antibody might in fact prevent the virus uh, from getting into cells. We also needed to have a way of measuring uh, the neutralizing activity of, of the antibodies uh, in the plasma and the monoclonal antibodies that we eventually um, produced. And this is the work of uh, Paul Beanash and Charlie Rice at Rockefeller, who are part of that group of laboratories um, that worked on this together. Uh, and what uh, Paul did was to create an assay in which he pseudotyped uh, an HIV virus, putting the spike protein on its surface and having a luciferase indicator inside so that we could uh, rapidly and easily uh, measure the neutralizing activity of antibodies or serum. And what this shows is that the pseudotype virus assay was really very highly correlated both for plasmas and antibodies with the authentic SARS um, virus uh, done uh, in Charlie Rice's lab. So we used this assay to measure the neutralizing activity in serum of um, about 150 people, 148. And what this graph shows is the top 60 of those people. Um, and what you can see here is among the top 60, uh, only half reached neutralizing titers above one to a thousand. And the remainder, below 60 are lower than this. And so um, the titers of neutralizing activity that were present in serum after uh, about a month and a half when we did this were not terribly high. What we learned in general from the serology was that there are people do make antibodies to the RBD, that part that binds to ACE2. Uh, and that generally people make relatively lower levels of, um, of neutralizing activity. And furthermore, that both arms of the antibody are required for optimal neutralization. This is something that Peter Walter, uh, later another Hughes investigator, later confirmed using nanobodies, that in fact you need two arms, you need cross-linking in order to neutralize optimally. Now, having uh, these individuals and their samples in hand, we could select a group of them for antibody cloning. And we did this exactly as I mentioned earlier, have collected samples. We had the viral protein, in this case, the RBD, the part that binds to ACE2. And then we could identify cells in the blood of these individuals and sort them out and then use molecular biology in order to uh, reproduce uh, their antibodies and test them. Again, we used the RBD as our bait for this because we knew that interfering with this reaction would be important. And this is what we found. So these are flow cytometry uh, experiments in which you have multiple individuals being tested for their binding to the RBD. And in the control, there are no cells, but in the corona patients, you can see that they all have cells that are in the memory compartment that bind to RBD. Now, these antibodies um, are uh, interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, and here, each one of these pie charts shows uh, one individual. The number in the middle is the number of antibodies that we cloned, and the pie slices are clones. So they're those expanded clones that I mentioned earlier uh, in the talk. And the colors indicate clones that are shared between individuals. And you can see that individuals, different individuals are actually producing antibodies uh, 
clones of antibodies that are really very, very closely related to each other. And in fact, this is true not only for the people that are infected with the coronavirus, but in work that we're currently doing, we've learned that the uh, people that receive the vaccines, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, also produce the same clones of expanded antibodies. Uh, in fact, about 40% of uh, the antibodies that are produced by those people are in shared clones. All right, in addition to learning something about um, uh, the antibodies, we also um, uh, were able to find antibodies that were extremely potent uh, in neutralizing the SARS virus. And um, this is shown here for pseudovirus and for the authentic virus. And these are nanogram uh, level IC50 uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, we wanted to understand something about how these antibodies neutralize the virus. And so um, we worked uh, with Pamela Bjorkman uh, and her colleagues at Caltech to do this. And in doing so, we've defined four different classes of antibodies um, and something about their mechanisms of neutralization. So um, I'm going to show this here because it explains something about why these clones are shared and why people that um, uh, are producing these antibodies seem to produce some very, very similar antibodies. So the first group of antibodies recognizes the receptor binding domain in gray when it is in the up configuration. So this is a floppy domain that can exist in both up and down configurations. And it's only in the up configuration that it will bind to ACE2. So the antibody class shown here binds to this uh, receptor uh, when it is only in the up configuration. And it does so by using um, parts of the antibody that are encoded in the genome and that are not dependent on VDJ recombination. So here you can see that so-called CDRH2 and CDRH1 make major contributions uh, to the binding mode. So that's encoded right away. Everybody has that. You don't need VDJ recombination. Uh, and that's why many of the clones that see this receptor in this particular way um, are shared between individuals. A second group of antibodies uh, binds to the same region, but does so both up and down configurations. And this particular example is very interesting because the uh, spike is a trimer. And what you can see here in this picture is that the antibody is binding both to two uh, RBDs at the same time. It does this in a very interesting way. Um, it pushes out a loop, the antibody loop, um, which has a series of hydrophobic residues and into a hydrophobic pocket in a neighboring RBD on the same trimer. And the result of that is that the antibody locks the RBD down in a configuration where it can no longer bind to ACE2 because it can only bind to ACE2 when it's up. And so this thing works in two different ways. It blocks ACE2 directly, but it also blocks ACE2 by freezing the spike in a down configuration. A third class of antibodies binds to RBD below ACE2 and interferes with its binding indirectly. So there are four classes. And this is important because they bind the, these two classes, one and two, they overlap, but this other class, three or four, do not overlap with these two. And so one can imagine that if there are mutations, such as the ones that we are seeing now emerging, that a combination of antibodies would help prevent their emergence or be able to deal with uh, mutations in one or another part of, of the RBD. Speaking of which, um, one of the things we were very interested in initially, and this is work from Paul Binash's lab, 
was whether or not the virus would be able to escape from the antibody system. So what Paul did was to create a virus uh, that mutates at a much higher level than the SARS virus uh, by pseudotyping a vesicular stomatitis virus with the SARS spike. So this has the guts of vesicular stomatitis virus, but the receptor on its surface is the spike from SARS coronavirus. And these experiments involve culturing this virus in the presence of antibody to see whether or not you can select for mutants. So when you use single antibodies, as one might predict, um, you always see escape, um, at least um, so far. But when you start using combinations to two non-overlapping sites, then this doesn't happen. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that the mutations that we found arising in response to antibodies included 484, uh, 417, and the 501 mutations, which we're seeing um, in these variant strains that are emerging uh, throughout the world. And you can see the data here. So this is why the two antibody thing works is uh, here are three antibodies targeting two different sites and wild type virus. This is their neutralization curves. And you can see that after culturing in the green antibody, you get a virus that is green resistant, but is still uh, susceptible to the other two antibodies. So of course the combination will get them. All right, so one of the things that we and others have been very interested in is um, what happens later? Um, and what happens after six months? Is immunity durable? And um, so we called back our participants and what we see here is the neutralization data on the participants um, after six months. And there is a drop in neutralizing activity, the red, uh, and it's proportional to the starting level. The other thing that we found is that um, the uh, memory compartment um, was um, highly stable uh, in a sense of numbers, but evolving in the sense of the clones. So here are the six individuals resorted, and you can see that their clones are evolving uh, and changing with time. The gray is uh, clones that only arise at one particular time point. Red are clones that are conserved. And we learned that the antibodies evolve with time um, and they are undergoing higher levels of somatic mutation in uh, the germinal centers. And you can see that the red, which is the second time point, becomes very good against a whole series of different mutants that the first time point did not see, including uh, the mutant E40, uh, 484K, uh, which is uh, among the emerging variants um, that we're seeing. And this, of course, is happening in the germinal centers. Now, just to summarize, the memory uh, response persists. The antibodies are evolving. They become broader and more potent over time. Uh, the T cells also uh, persist, another component of the immune system. Um, T and B cell abnormalities are, are detectable in both compartments. Um, and there's evidence that there is some persistent antigen in the form of nucleic acids or protein in the gut that may account for this um, uh, evolution. And the important point is immunity appears to be lasting after infection. Now, antibodies are in the news uh, for therapies and for protection. I just want to show you that, uh, in fact, uh, this, is, this is why. Um, and you can see here two different experiments in hamsters, which are sort of the gold standard for this, uh, and looking at lung uh, virus, uh, uh, PFUs. You can see the control here, 10 to the 6th. And then antibodies given before infection for prevention are really highly effective, even at very low doses, two milligrams per kilogram. And for therapy given shortly after infection are also highly effective uh, in, in, in preventing uh, pathology.
So the anticipated uses of passive antibody therapies are early therapies for those uh, that do not take or fail to respond to vaccine and protection for people who cannot respond to vaccine. And there are many categories of those people. Um, so um, I just want to summarize by saying that um, although this has been a relatively short time, we've learned a great deal about this virus and the human immune response uh, to this virus by cloning antibodies uh, from, from these people. Um, we've learned that the antibodies are shared. We know something about why they're shared. Uh, we've defined classes of different antibodies with very potent activities against the virus. Um, and uh, we've learned something about how they might be useful clinically. And in, in fact, they're being developed by a number of different companies for this. Um, I just want to reiterate again that this is the work of many, many people, uh, both at Rockefeller and elsewhere, in particular at Caltech, uh, the Bjorkman Lab, at, and, and at Rockefeller, very close collaboration with the BNASH Lab and the Rice Lab um, and a whole series of other labs around the country. Um, so thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for the great talk on neutralizing antibodies and the antibody discovery uh, methods. And I really appreciate the basics that you talked about in the beginning of the talk. Uh, so let's get right into the questions. Um, we have a question from uh, Bruce Dillman. Um, Bruce, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Let's see, Bruce. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Bruce, would you please unmute uh, yourself? Uh, great talk, Michelle. Do people who have got the um, the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines do they have a, a sufficient polyclonal antibody repertoire that would be resistant to the new RBD variants that are emerging in South Africa and Britain? Yeah. So, uh, Bruce, the um, the major class of antibodies um, that everybody makes, whether they're Moderna, Pfizer, or infected, includes this class one and two, where the 484 mutation is really at the center of the epitope. Um, and so um, it seems like uh, the vaccines will cover because they are polyclonal, but may be less effective uh, against those variants. Um, Actually, I had another question. Um, you mentioned that there's um, genetically encoded parts of the antibody in the non-variable regions that are um, binding to the up region of the spike. Yeah. Um, how variable are they in the population, the sequences of those? Everybody has them. Everybody has them. And they are the dominant. If you take uh, 1,400 or 2,000 antibodies that you clone, which we've done, uh, and, and look at um, what V regions are represented, there's a highly, highly biased overrepresentation for the antibodies that are binding in this manner. And those are the antibodies, again, that are uh, where the epitope is 484 is right in the center of that. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you, Bruce. Um, thank you. Michelle, I'd like to extend Bruce's question to the monoclonal antibody cocktails that are currently approved for therapy. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on, I mean, first of all, the question is, what do the are the four classes of monoclonal antibodies that you described uh, are they present in both the uh, Regeneron and Ili cocktail? And if so, what's your take on the efficacy of the antibody cocktail against the new variants? Okay, so the Regeneron so I don't know exactly because we haven't tested it, but um, what I believe is that the Regeneron cocktail will be effective because it includes class one or two uh, and class three. Mm -hmm. um, and although the class one antibodies may be affected by the 484 mutation and these other mutations, 501 and 417, um, 
the other class, uh, the class three, uh, may not be uh, or is unlikely to be. So the Regeneron cocktail, I believe, will be effective. The other ones um, I know less about in terms of exactly what kind of antibodies are in there. And so it's very hard for me to say. Mm -hmm. But certainly the ones that are single antibodies, I would say, um, would generally be bad idea, would be a bad idea. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. And, and there's one other thing that I'd like to say is that these, these mutations are not random mutations that are coming up. These mutations, which are coming up in multiple locations, actually, are, are, are very much focused on um, the RBD um, sites that antibodies bind to. Mm -hmm. And uh, these mutations do come up in vitro under pressure. And so these, you can think of these as immune escape mutations. Um, at least the ones in the RBD. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, do, how does one select? How do we do selection for those kinds of mutations in the laboratory? Well, we use suboptimal amounts of antibody uh, in those uh, cultures. And what is the best way for the virus to develop these kinds of things? And it would be for suboptimal immunization. Uh, so the idea that uh, we're going to immunize once mm. and produce a suboptimal response and create, you know, a very large cohort of people uh, that are fertile ground for selection is is really not not the best idea. So definitely go with two doses. I definitely try to optimize this immunization so that you, in fact, get a very high level of immunity. Uh, well, uh, extending that question once again. So you talked about, we talked about vaccines, we talked about antibody cocktails. So, but what about nanobodies? So, you know, I, I, um, I think there are a lot of potential uses for nanobodies, um, but, um, uh, they'd have to be, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of work that has to be done in order to make them uh, practical for, for example, for delivery, nasal delivery, or, you know, other, other sorts of mechanisms of delivery. Uh, so um, although they, they could be very useful in the future, right now, I, 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 I just don't see that they're going to be clinically useful. Interesting. Um... So let's see, uh, switching gears slightly, uh, you talked about early therapy using the antibodies. So I guess in this case, the timeline is gonna be critical, mm -hmm. right? So it is, it is because once, once the damage is done um, after a week or 10 days, uh, the damage is done and, and it's, not, it's not so much the virus uh, anymore uh, and so uh, it's too late for the antibodies. So the antibodies really have to be administered early. Uh, that's been a problem because they've been uh, being administered intravenously, which means that people have to go to an infusion center and sit in a chair, uh, occupy that chair for quite some time. Um, and and that's, that's really an issue, especially if somebody's infected and the infusion centers are full of cancer patients and so on. It's just uh, not not ideal. And so what's necessary is to have another way of delivery, subcutaneous, for example, or intramuscular, uh, where somebody who gets a diagnosis early just gets a shot, goes to CPS, goes to their doctor's office, uh, and, and gets a shot. And that's not yet available. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and now we have uh, an audience question. Valerie, uh, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Um, I'm Valerie Mizrahi from uh, University of Cape Town. So we're sitting here in the eye of the storm of the 501YV2 variant that has the mutations you've described, E484K, uh, 501Y, uh, 
uh, and we still don't have vaccines in the country. And so we're dealing with a double challenge, which is that when we get vaccines, because we are a lower middle income country, we'll get them in phase, uh, in phase two. So do I understand correctly that we should be quite concerned about the staged dosing um, a problem and the delay of giving the second dose. And again, if you could just clarify this question that I think Bruce did yeah. probe you on, the yeah. nature of the clinical so, response. So, um, you yeah. know, we really are concerned about this problem right. here. Right. Thank, right. thank you so much. Right. So there are two problems here. One is how do you keep people out of the, you know, keeping people out of the hospital? And the second one is creating new variants. So for keeping people out of the hospital, uh, there's a tremendous argument that says give everybody or give as many people as you can whatever you can because it's going to keep some people out of the hospital and that is going to avert public health disaster. So uh, that's, that's, that's a very uh, important and strong argument. Um, so even if the vaccine isn't working that well against the variants, it's working somewhat. And that's enough to avert uh, a public health problem, uh, a real disaster. The second issue relates to creating new variants that are even more resistant to vaccine or antibodies. Um, and that's going to happen um, in people that are suboptimally immunized. Uh, and so these two things, um, you know, they. They go against each other, um, but that's where we are. Right. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, our next question is from Chitu Mayer. Chitu, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Um, um, uh, Michelle, this is Jitu from Bangalore. Uh, amazing talk. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, how long do these uh, antibodies last? Uh, that's the first question. And then, in, uh, and is reinfection because new strains are being, uh, are, are uh, reinfecting people? Or is reinfection because the antibodies are no longer, you know, are no longer effective or you know, no longer neutralizing in their titers? Well, probably, you know, both things are possible, um, certainly in terms of reinfection. Um, and, uh, you know, there are not that many reported cases of reinfection, but it's early days. Uh, in our own cohort of 148 people, after nine months, we have our first reinfection. Um, and so, um, and, and we know that the antibody levels are waning. So certainly, uh, waning antibody levels will allow for reinfection and more resistant variants um, will also uh, reinfect uh, as antibody levels wane. Right, and, and a, and a follow-up. I mean, do you have any, any idea about the, uh, the AstraZeneca-Oxford vaccine and what kind of epitopes that generates? Oh, what kind of epitopes that? Uh... They, 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 no, we have not. We have not studied those people, but it's the same target protein, and I would be quite surprised if it's different. Um, OK, thank you. Thank you, Jitu. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I guess with this, we will move on to our next speaker for the day, uh, Jeannie Garbarino, who will talk to us about Rockefeller University's um, outreach program. 